Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palanker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. Today on the show, we've got monster, hit making, soul stirring songman Gary Puckett in mm-hmm. person, right here with us. But first, Fritz, I have been running some reading and viewing interference and recognizance for you guys. So, what have you come up with, Fritz? Okay, well, I, I thought because the regular baseball season started last week uh, that I would offer this suggestion. This to me, and I'm not a huge baseball fan, but but this to me is the greatest baseball movie I've ever seen. Bar none, Field of Dreams, Moneyball, whatever your favorite is, this is the one because it's so real. It's called Battered Bastards of Baseball. It's on Netflix. It It, it is so real. It is the essence of of baseball and not the slick corporate juggernaut that is the major league teams. This is the true story of the Portland Mavericks, a scrappy independent minor league baseball team. Independent meaning they're not part of a farm system of a major league team. They're just sort of out there on their own. They were started by actor Bing Russell in the 1970s. Now, Bing was a journeyman, career man in television and movies. He was uh, uh, an actor that had some reasonable success. He played the sheriff on Gunsmoke for years. He was also a baseball fanatic. He knows the game inside out. He's a statistician. He even did instructional videos to teach kids about baseball basics. Bing Russell also just happens to be the father of actor Kurt Russell, who is a recurring narrator in this film. Now, the Portland Mavericks played five seasons, Minor league ball was dead in Portland before that. They would have like 40 people in the stands at some of their games. And B. Russell starts his team, has open tryouts, pays these guys only $500 a month, puts together a ragtag group of baseball wannabes, teaches them the basics, builds confidence, and the Mavericks are playing all the regular affiliated minor league teams filled with what they call bonus babies. These are potential star players put in the minors by the majors to grow their talent. They played them and beat the tar out of them. They were often embarrassing to these gold medal teams. And this is where the David and Goliath story comes in. Major League Baseball didn't want to be embarrassed by this lowly group of ne'er-do-wells. And so they started to put corporate pressure on them to drive them out of Portland and out of the business completely. And this is a story that gets to the true joy of American boys that just want to play baseball. Many of them are too old. They're not in good physical shape. They might not be talented enough to get drafted into the big leagues, but they make it on sheer guts and love of the game. There are some other highlights like Jim Bouton, a major league pitcher whose career ended when he wrote an unflattering book about inside baseball called Ball Four. The Mavericks hired him. He worked his way back into the major leagues. The term battered bastards of baseball came from Bouton's book where he said, us battered bastards of baseball are the biggest customers of the U.S. Postal Service forwarding address department. <laughs> If this movie interests you, you can try Screwball, Fastball, or another great documentary, Brooklyn Dodgers, The Ghosts of Flatbush. It's, I don't care if you're a baseball fan or not. This is just a great inspirational movie, Wiz. And also, PBS has been rerunning the heck out of uh, Ken Burns' baseball, which is just fun to pick up at any point oh, yeah. in the whole trajectory yeah. and just kind of yeah. just... That goes I, way deep. It's so yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It, it's, it's really wonderful. What so, do you got? My first pick is uh, Billie Eilish, The World's a Little Blurry. This is on Apple Plus, Apple Streaming. Uh, This film takes a long, thoughtful, and personal look at teenage singer-songwriter Billie Eilish and her family, which includes her mom and her dad and her brother Phineas. From my adult perspective, it's the story of how you raise an extraordinary child. And as parents of brilliant kids will no doubt tell you, their childhood is not just a celebration of their remarkable aptitude. It's also a struggle with the darkness that often shadows genius. And with Billy, it is that pain and anguish which resonates so much with all of her fans. She is able to channel her distress into her music that launches her into stardom. But is all of this success healing for her? To know that her pain is so universal, is that helpful? Or is it an additional complication that needs to be addressed and balanced? This is a beautiful film from R.J. Cutler, and it follows Billy's journey on the road, on stage, and at home with her family as she and Phineas write and record her debut album, which dramatically alters the trajectory 
of her life. I love her. I just love her whole attitude. She's very honest and real, and her lyrics are beautiful, and her voice is haunting. I, yeah, and I you just forget her. how young she is. She yeah. was like 16 when she made this album. She's Wise like, writing, absolutely. Yeah, she's like 17 years old. Well, my second choice is Elizabeth and Margaret, Love and Loyalty. It's Netflix. I watched this because it's a documentary version of an area covered on The Crown, one of my favorite all-time TV shows. And it's about the relationship between Queen Elizabeth and her sister, Princess Margaret. I, I wanted to see if The Crown was accurate, and it pretty much was. Margaret and Elizabeth were inseparable sisters early in their lives. They did everything together. They dressed alike. Elizabeth was the guardian of her younger sister. Margaret was the adoring younger playmate. And then everything changed. King Edward decided to abdicate so he could marry divorcee Wallace Simpson. That threw the whole royal line of succession into turmoil. He was succeeded by King George, who was Elizabeth and Margaret's father. That put Elizabeth in line to be queen after her father passed, and therein lies the whole change in the family dynamics. When she was being groomed to be the monarch, and when she ultimately was crowned monarch, her life became 100% about the continuity of the crown. Her relationship with her sister had to take a back seat. This is a story about sibling love, sibling jealousy, trying to find a place on the planet when you know you don't have any official stature, not being able to love or marry the people you want to because of disapproval by the royal court. It's interesting history, but you come away with it with the same hollow feeling you get watching the crown, and that is that everybody in the Windsor family, the queen, her husband, the Duke of Windsor, all the kids, all the relatives are each one so intensely lonely and unfulfilled. If you think you want to wear a tiara and live in Buckingham Palace, you'll think twice about it when you see this movie. I liked it. Yeah, I haven't seen this one yet, but I, 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 I am obsessed with the royal family, so I've read a lot about it. And I would say, you know, watching something like this may give you a good indication if you're if you sit around wondering what's going on between William and Harry. Well, what is it like to have to report to your sibling and not only as a boss, but as your monarch? So yeah. that's kind of awkward. And I think that's that's kind of like what's looming on the horizon for William and Harry. And Harry said, I'm going to bounce <laughs> and uh, more credit to him. All right. I have one more. It's called uh, this is on Amazon Prime. It's called Tennessee Whiskey, the Dean Dillon story. Dean Dillon is a legendary Nashville songwriter, and this film is built around a club performance where Dean is just sitting on a stool with his guitar, weaving his biggest hit songs around the stories that inspired and generated them. Dean's songs include The Chair, Oceanfront Property, Nobody in His Right Mind Would Have Left Her, Spilled Perfume, and of course, Tennessee Whiskey, recently covered by Justin Timberlake. So the doc includes interviews with, with his career collaborators, predominantly George Strait, Kenny Chesney and, and Toby Keith. So if you love songwriting and you just love kind of tapping into like what is the spiritual energy that 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 infuses songwriters, this is a, a great peek into a, a brilliant one, Dean Dillon. I want to see that. There have been a couple of good docs about uh, Nashville songwriting and how that is now ground zero for the greatest writers in all music, not just country, but everything. They're all down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of which, I just read about something about Gary Puckett, and we're going to talk about him as if he's not here. Where right. um, his his first hit was actually first was first recorded as a country song, or was supposed to have been. Is that correct, Gary? It was recorded as a country song by Tom Paul and the Glazer Brothers. It was written by uh, two of the members of the band, um, Jim Glazer and Jimmy Payne. Yeah, great, great, great song. And all of your songs are just so memorable. And those are the songs that kind of spin around our, our brain all day long once we hear them in the morning. So welcome, Gary Puckett. We're so excited to have you here with us. And I'm going to give a little background on Gary. Gary Puckett was born in Hibbing, Minnesota and grew up in Yakima, Washington, close to Union Gap and Twin Falls, Idaho. He began playing guitar in his teens, graduated from Twin Falls High School in 1960, and attended college in San Diego, California. He played in several local bands before joining The Outcasts, a local, a local group which was formidable, producing two singles, but you guys did not enjoy domestic harmony. Is that correct, Gary? Well, the band was a little volatile. Um, you know, we had two leaders in the band and we were only three guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it made it a little fun. difficult at times because... Uh, 
you know, the other guys wanted to be the leader. They wanted to call the songs. They wanted to call the shots. And I was kind of the guy in between saying, hey, come on, let's just have fun. We're making good money and it's supposed to be uh, it's supposed to be a good time for us in this point in our lives. Is that the role you played in your own family? My own family? Peacemaker? No, I- um, no, I don't think so. I was the oldest child. Are you talking about me and my siblings? And yeah, all that kind of stuff? yeah. Well, you know, I suppose in a way my, my parents always said, okay, Gar, we're going to do this. We want you to watch all the kids. You know? oh. I, I never really liked that whole thing, but, um, well, you know, my brothers and sisters and I are very close these days. So mm-hmm. it's good. Cool. Cool. Uh, Gary then formed a group called Gary and the Remarkables, which was renamed the Union Gap in early 1967 and began topping the charts in the late 60s with massive hits, including Woman, Woman, the aforementioned Young Girl, Lady Willpower, Over You, Don't Give In to Him, and This Girl is a Woman Now. The Union Gap dazzled and delighted audience in their Civil War Union Army uniforms, which before the Union Gap we had not often seen in color. Are we certain, Gary, that the Union Army wore powder blue? <laughs> no, we know that they did not. That's, There's no Matthew Brady record of the exact shade. Um, how? How? I just have a quick question before we jump into the music. How were these outfits met in the South? Well, um, they were met well, actually. We um, uh, the first time we went to the South, it was Birmingham, Alabama, and we were going to do one of those uh, um, shower of stars or one of those where they had a week long of concerts and um, lots and lots of acts and things. And we went down there thinking, well, gee whiz, we wear Northern outfits and uh, we're going to the Confederate uh, part of the world, you know? So we were a little worried about it, but uh, we went to some store and got a great big um, Confederate flag and we rolled it up, laid it over the keyboards. And when we walked out on stage for the performance, we got on either side of it and unfurled it and about 6,000 people Gave out with the rebel yell, and I knew that. Okay. <laughs> it's called survival. You do whatever you do to survive the gig, right? Yeah. I, I, I was really Dixon impressed line. with that, and I think you're the one that came up with the Civil War uniform idea, and you must have had an early sense of branding because you had this name and the uniform, and it was a complete package way before people were thinking about that kind of stuff. Well, it, it worked out well in so much as um, – you know, I kept thinking, what can we do to be different? How can we have a visual that's going to be different than everybody else? And you guys remember what we were wearing in those days from platform shoes to, uh, you know, Tom Jones shirts, the billowy sleeves and uh, um, leathers and fringes and tie dyes and, you know, all the stuff. And holy jeans started in those days. And everybody was wearing the same stuff on stage as they were wearing on the street. And I thought, You know, it's a very it's a difficult business to get into, and it would probably be a good idea if we had something that made somebody stop and look first before they listen. And I I kind of uh, I thought, well, you know, hmm, and I thought and thought and thought. And one day we were working in Seattle at the time and it was February. It was cold. Um, It was rainy uh, and we were all living in this little two room place. And I said, aha, I've got it. I always had an interest in the Civil War period in time, and and it's really well documented, as you know, by looking online. You can find incredible photos of that era and the people that fought and the people that died. And and um, I said, this is this is the outfit we're going to wear. And when I thought Union soldier, it just was automatic Union Gap. I used to hitchhike to Union Gap when I was 15 years old to do my Saturday job. And um, I thought, there it is, the look and the name, you know, what's in a name? Because people would say to me, what does Union Gap mean? And I would just say, it's just a name, you know? Um, I used to say, well, what does Rolling Stones mean? Nothing, it's just a cool name. And it got cooler as time went by, if you know what I mean. What would we find if we drove down the main drag of Union Gap? Now, um, hmm, you'd find a suburban town, uh, you know, with all the typical restaurants and the things that go on, uh, you know, auto places, whatever. Uh, I haven't been there for a few years, but uh, we hope to go back one day uh, and do another concert. Um, it was a lot of fun the last time. Is there a Union Gap Gap? <laughs> Union Gap Gap. I'm a not gap sure. Story what you mean, you. <laughs> 
You know, so we, did you guys do your thing before or after Paul Revere and the Raiders? We were after Paul Revere. He was from Boise, and um, I think they started around 66. Um, so they were well established on the charts when uh, we, we got going, which was actually um, recorded the first record August 17th of 67, released September 17th. Um, and it was into Christmas time before we had some activity uh, because in those days they released records as an A and a B side and the radio stations could choose which one they wanted to play. So there came a point, of course, when the record companies realized if they gave record companies a choice, one could work against the other, which was happening for us. And uh, just because of my brilliant idea i'm gonna say uh with the union soldier outfits we had taken a great photo black and white actually turned it into sepia tone and there was a program director disc jockey in columbus ohio who was a civil war historian and when he saw the picture he said this is a great picture i wonder what this record sounds like uh -huh. so fortunately for me he loved the record and he put it on his station as he called a pick to click and it went <laughs> to number one. That's when uh, Columbia Records regional office in Cleveland called me and said, um, you have a number one record. I said, no, really. And they said, yep, in Columbus, Ohio. They said, we now know how to make this a big hit record across the states and maybe a across the waters. So um, they said, we're going to bring you to Cleveland. We're going to put you to work in a club. It was in the basement of the Sheridan Hotel. It was called Otto's Grotto um, and a very <laughs> hip kind of club in its day there in Cleveland. So we went up there. We went to work. And every day I would go out with the fellow from Columbia Records. His name was Steve Popovich. And we'd ride around and he'd push the buttons on the radio and 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 listen to the stations that they serviced to see what records they were playing. And that was where I first heard Woman Woman on the air. And it was thrilling, truly exciting. That, that was your first hit, 1967. Yes. And well, it was late 67, so yeah. it, really, it really fell over into 1968. But you were sort of, after the British invasion wave was cresting, what a competitive time in music. You had the British invasion, then you had psychedelia and all this creative stuff, but you had a couple of amazing things going for you. First of all, you have one of the most beautiful voices in pop music. Thank you. Second of all, you had these great, as Wheezy mentioned, hooks, very memorable hooks. And uh, so it, it was, it was a, 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 a really a competitive time in the music industry. And it's kind of interesting that you were able to become the force you were all, all the way up till 1971. Well, thank you for all of that. I, I'm not really sure what to reply. I, uh, um, I feel, I, I mean, I'm lucky to have a signature voice. It was God's gift to me. And all I have to do is keep it healthy. Uh, it gets a little harder as I get older, but uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to have made some records that really have withstood the test of time. And uh, in fact, recently I did an hour guest DJ on Sirius. I listened to it. Got, I listened to the rebroadcast too on Wednesday. Oh, or you did. That was well, that I was fun. You Thank you very much. Well, they they had uh, gotten in touch with me and said you're one of our core artists. And I said, like, well, uh, what? Really? How, how could I be a core artist? They said we play you constantly because the fans love your music. So. Uh, they said, how would you like to be on and do a guest shot? And I said, I would love it. So anyway, um, you heard it. Uh, you see how it turned out. And they've actually asked me now to do a second. That'll be in uh, May, maybe June. So anyway, um, why was I saying that? <laughs> uh, um, I was just talking just about, about survival at the, at the time in the music business when you guys came along. It was probably as competitive as it ever was. Just but to, just the timelessness of the songs, I think. Because, yeah. you know, you were talking in an article that I read about how your grandkids love love of the songs they do I mean, um lady willpower is a favorite of both of the the seven and the four-year-old and uh, when i get i'm getting a bigger dose of my own music now <laughs> than i did in those days because i fantastic. get in the car with them and they say put on the music please 
Do, so, your, uh, do your grandchildren think it's much cooler than your kids ever thought it was? <laughs> well, it wasn't until we came home one day when um, I found the, the teenage daughters at that time uh, watching me on YouTube. And that's when I found they had all their friends with them and they were watching videos. And that's when I realized that they thought I was cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, funny. that's adorable. You know, yeah. you know, How old were you? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Weezy, please. I mean, a boy's voice changes and it probably doesn't settle down till like 17 or whatever, depending on the kid. But like how when did you first recognize the power of your voice? I never did. I did not know. Um, my mother years ago when when I, I'm the oldest out of five and when we were growing up, my parents would uh, uh, my dad would go rent a tape recorder and he would bring it home. And so over a period of you know, a week or however long it was, we would tape messages to my grandparents. Now, this is when we lived in Washington State in, uh, I think it was Tacoma. Uh, I'm remembering it uh, for a couple of years. At any rate, we would tape messages and sing them songs. And I had sung Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer mm. uh, to my grandparents. And when I heard it years ago, my mother said to me, I just thought it was natural that all little boys your age could sing like that. And it was this little pure, very high soprano voice. And uh, I thought, my goodness, you know, it, uh, it, uh, wow, what can I say? Um, so I never really realized that I had a a gift, a signature. Um, my dad was in, in barbershop quartet. And as a kid, he and uh, his he was in two groups. One was called the Four Dads. The other was called the Four Quarters. And they would come to the house and I would sit there 9, 10, 11, 12 years old and listen to them sing. In fact, I would go with my dad at times when they would have these competitions. You probably know about them, the barbershop quartet competitions, and just be amazed um, at the harmonies and things. That you learned how to harmonize with that, I'm yeah. guessing, huh? Yeah. And then I grew up with the Everly Brothers, you know, yeah. so stuff like that. But, um, you know, I never really realized it, but I always knew that I wanted to do this, though, because um, as a child, as a six, seven, eight year old, my parents sat me at the piano. My mother is a, was a pianist. Uh, my dad was a saxophonist. They both sang extremely well. And I was just lucky uh, to inherit the qualities of their voice. Um, so they sat me at the piano and they said, you're going to learn to play the piano. And I was like any eight year old kid. I'd rather be out chasing garter snakes, you know, and doing the things that uh, seven and eight year old boys do. But I learned to play some piano um, when I was 15. I found a guitar in my grandparents' attic, uh, an old Spanish styled guitar. And, um, you know, that was exciting to me because guitars were a big deal through the 50s when I was growing up. So that was launching me into it all. My parents wanted me to go on to school, to higher education, do something significant, you know, be better than they were. Uh, my dad worked hard all of his life. Um, I think he did well in providing for his family. Um, but all parents want their kids to do better than they did, you know. But I went to college two years thinking, well, maybe I can do child psychology, criminal psychology, something like that. Um, but then after a couple of years, I just went full force toward the music thing. And it still took years, you know, to get it together and worked in a... Um, a uh, auto supply store for a couple of years and worked my way up through their ranks into managing the store and ordering the parts and, um, you know, driving to LA once a week and doing all the, the necessary things that you had to do for the auto business. But um, one day I just said to the owners, both of them, you know, fans of mine, because I was smart enough to do what they needed me to do as an employee of theirs. And, and um, I said, guys, I'm going to take a pause. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go for the music thing. Um, I may or may not be back. They said, if you need to be back, your job is still here. So uh, mm -hmm. I had that cushion to fall back on, but I went full force at it and um, was able to make it work. Awesome. Wow. So I want to talk about your signing with Columbia. Sure. 
uh, in 67 because your first hit, Woman, Woman, I think was recorded with members of the Wrecking Crew. Am I correct? Yes, a lot of them were there. It was about a 30-piece orchestra that we had that day. Um, I believe the only person in the band that didn't play and if he did he would have played something like tambourine or something shake or something of that nature because um hal blaine was on drums um because he was the proven drummer you know uh, among others that were a part of uh you know the wrecking crew bunch they they weren't named that as you know until much later but hal blaine was there um gosh who else mike dacey uh um, uh, Howard Roberts was there, Carol Kay. Uh, I know that Carrie Chater, our bass player, sat next to Carol Kay and they played the same chart um, and they mixed their sound together because Carrie told me one day, he said, Carol Kay turned to me and said, did you get bar 32? I don't think I got it. I hope you did. <laughs> so uh, anyway, well, what yes. was great about that was that your band, the musicianship of your band was so proficient that after, like by the third record, Columbia was allowing you to record the tracks on your own record and pretty much control the circumstances. Yeah, and write all the songs as well, yeah. which in the beginning, um, Jerry Fuller, our producer, didn't let us write much. Um, but I think he had a vision and, and forethought to, uh, he was a singer and a song man, you know? And I think that the way he produced these records all these years later, when I'm lucky enough to hear myself, you know, on the radio or wherever, the records still sound great, you know, and um, I think that's a big secret to the success. And I give him great, uh, great credit for his writing abilities, his producing abilities and, and his thought about, you know, he came kind of from the big band area, the singer and the song kind of thing. So um, fortunately, here I am all these years later. I didn't even think I'd get to be this age, let alone still be doing what I'm doing at this age. Well, now you sing your songs a lot, Gary, probably a little uh, more, a little more than uh, I do, possibly. But have you <laughs> noticed that in Lady Willpower, you are sweet talking a woman into sex and in Don't Give In To Him, you are warning a woman about a guy who is attempting to sweet talk her <laughs> into sex. See, you guys see it all wrong. Okay. OK, yeah. um, I, I always got flack about all these songs and their lyrics and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and if you if you read the lyrics, you'll see where in Young Girl, for instance, he's saying, hey, listen, you know, beneath your perfume and makeup, you're just a baby in disguise. I didn't see that. You led me to believe you were old enough. And now I see that you're not. So go away. That's the truth of the song and the guy in the song. So he was an upstanding guy. Same thing in Lady Willpower. But. She's no longer underage. He's saying, I, I want to love you. It wasn't about sex as much as it was about love. You know, the same. I mean, this girl as a woman now is probably closer to that. But it's about a girl having for the first time in her life had sex and became a woman, you know, so. I don't know. You used to get I think a lot the of taboo, about it. the taboo suggestions in those make them more interesting songs. Well, I think that you got you guys were singing more directly about the stuff that every song is about. <laughs> you were just getting to the point. You know what? It's it's all how you see it, and that's okay. Yeah. It's all in relation, and uh, the fact that we're still singing those songs together, and um, you know, I, I, I we're going to do our first gig in actually second in a in a year and fourteen. Uh, a year and what? I, what am I trying to say here? 13 months, mm -hmm. because it was March 8 when I came home in 2020. And um, we did one date on the 29th of January, and we're going down to Fort Myers to work at the Barber Man uh, Performing Arts Center this coming uh, Saturday. So I'll be looking at the people. They'll be oh, singing fun. the songs. It's going to be uh, great to be back again. Oh, Original members be. of the band? You know, no original members except for me. Um, everybody has retired and taken a different path in life. I always liken it to being married, only in this case, you're married to four or five other people, you know. So it's um, it's difficult when you all have goals and directions and ideas and things you want to do. And it's it's easy. Back in our day, the actual statistic was that a band would stay together for about 14 months. Wow. 
I think you have, you you know, you have more kind of like longevity if you're able to brand your act with your own name when mm-hmm. you're when you're cranking out the hits because now you're Gary Puckett and you know any time you walk in a room you're still Gary Puckett and those guys you know they're like hey we were in the union gap you know they have to like show you on <laughs> on Google <laughs> but so the branding i think is important when people are starting out well um perceptive and and thank you for bringing it up um i can't take credit for that branding actually because i just called it the union gap um, because I, that's, that's how I saw it. I mean, I wanted to sing, I wanted to record, I wanted to get out in the world and, and work with the likes of the Beach Boys in Chicago and all the others, you know, that were out there. But at the same time, I didn't uh, see myself as being in front. However, with a 30 piece orchestra, and me being the vocalist, the record company said, well, wait a minute. So they said, okay, we'll call it the Union Gap featuring Gary Puckett. That was on Woman Woman. On the second single, they said, this group is called Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. So fortunately for me, uh, they elevated me to that lead position. Yeah, you got a promotion. So yeah. when you go out on the Happy uh, Together tour, you spend a lot of time on the road with acts that you used to just miss coming in as they came out. Are you guys all getting a chance to learn what you had always wondered about one another? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, it's really true. Uh, um, you know, since 84, 1984, when I was on the very first Happy Together tour, that one was a little hectic because there had not been an oldies tour that had gone out yet. So it, it, we didn't know how to do it. The promoters didn't know how to do it. All they knew is they would book it and we were all responsible for getting there ourselves you know so uh i bought a a a big ford econo line uh it was black uh the rest of the 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 group called it the pucket bucket (laughs) (laughs) and uh, many of us traveled in that vehicle as many as could get in there um the other groups the association spanky traveled with us because my band became her band and my brother Brian play, ultimately ended up playing drums for uh, Spanky, for me, and for the association throughout that tour. Oh, cool. But it, it turned out to be really good. And uh, later, when they started the Happy Together thing again, which is now, I think, going to be in its 12th year this, this coming year, uh, and they'll, they'll go out this summer. I don't know the, if they'll do as many dates, but we've traveled a lot together. I've traveled with um, the grassroots. I've traveled with Gary Lewis. Uh, I've traveled with uh, Mark Lindsay. I've traveled with Davy Jones and Peter Tork. And, you know, when you travel with them, you get to chatting and talking. And uh, uh, it's nice to uh, hear the truth of life and, uh, and what's going on in, in their world. You know, uh, the, the, uh, I'm sure you're astonished. Uh, I'll, I'll call you a baby boomer era band b- because you were part of people's lives and they were really becoming aware of music. But the insane money now that these bands are making, uh, doing these tours like the Eagles and, um, charging $2,000 a ticket for, <laughs> for uh, their shows and the stones continuing and all the there's huge money for those era of bands. Isn't that crazy? Yes, <laughs> it, it is crazy. Um, I'm, I'm just pleased that I have lots of fans out there who still want to hear me, yeah. you know? So um, I don't, I'm not on the level of the stones and all the other big ones like that, the Chicago's and the Credence Clearwater revivals. Uh, Chicago was once my opening act. Uh, Credence was once my opening act. Uh, You know, and and it's terrific that that the fans just want to see us and hear the music. So I'm willing to go out there and do whatever it takes. Next year, we'll be in Australia for four weeks in February. Um, Let's see. uh, We've got a bunch of dates. We'll be doing 22s coming together for my band. I, I, they say that I'm supposed to be asked to to be on the uh, uh, 2022 Happy Together. I'm not sure of that yet, but we'll see. Um, But if it happens, I'll be out there. You know, how many players do you take with you when you go on the road? Uh, Well, my band is just four people, three Mm -hmm. plus me. Mm -hmm. So that's all we are. We fit into a minivan very well. 
My guys are totally capable. Uh, my bassist, Woody Lingle, is also my advanced guy and, and band leader, uh, Mike Candido, incredible drummer, um, Jamie Hillbolt, keyboards. He's got three keys and he uses his computers. We play it all, but he keeps his sounds in the computers. And um, I can play without playing guitar. Uh, they're, they're that good. They read, they write, they teach. Um, and and we're going to do this as long as they want to be with me. I want to be with them. So I take those three guys and that's it. When we do the Happy Together tour, I go alone and I use the band that uh, is Happy Together. And that's uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, that's five guys. And it's a, a really great band. Yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times because I made a film uh, about the Cow Sills. So I've been out to see those guys with you. And I remember the year, maybe it was a couple years ago, but it was like getting to see you and Chuck Negron, which I think are the two finest voices in rock and roll history. Thank you. He, and I couldn't believe the sound. And it's just, it's so pure and it's its so gorgeous. So I, I commend you for taking such good care of your instrument because it's a treat for us to hear it. And so thank you for that. How have you been productively spending your, your pandemic? Well... We have three grandkids that are seven, four, and 20 months, and we spend a lot of time with them. Um, our daughter, their mother, is a doctor, and because of the pandemic, there's been a hiring hold. She just went through her residency. So we've been doing whatever we can to, um, you know, help them, keep them um, alive and happy, so to speak, you know. Uh, I every day I play guitar. Um, I I enjoy to learn something every day. I've done a lot of songwriting. We'll see where that goes. You never know. You know, um, I've been digging back into some of the songs that my brother David and I wrote years ago. And uh, I just realized that I have 16. No, it's 14 songs that David and I had written because of our faith. We are both born again. And um, we had written a whole bunch of songs, which I had recorded, just me sitting at the piano, and they're just me live. But I listened to every one of them, and I went, hmm, those are pretty good. I think I should get those out to the fans. So I'm going to put out an album that's just me sitting at the piano singing these songs, and uh, I think the fans will receive it well. Uh, hopefully, it will bless some people. Of course. I know it will. Now, you know, uh, I love influences, and you were strongly influenced by the Stax sound and their house band, Steve Cropper and Duck Dunn and Booker T. Jones. And talk about that, because to me, uh, that group, plus the Muscle Shoals guys, were the basis for R&B in the United States. They were, they were the best. They were fantastic. Um, There's just no doubt about it. Uh, the whole Blues Brothers thing brought it really to the fore, mm -hmm. you know, in, in front of our faces because we were seeing Belushi and... and um, Aykroyd. Uh, yes. <laughs> on TV. Uh, anyway, yes. Uh, people like Cropper, um, you know, the people of that ilk uh, um, excited me. Um, I used to take all of their records and go on the road with them and and... The first time I heard Sam and Dave, you know, hold on, I'm coming, that kind of thing. It just uh, kind of, as we like to say, blew me away. And and it was it was something that I always loved doing. And that I think that's partly why I was able to. Well, I was fortunate to put together the members of the Union Gap, the original guys, because um, two of them, Gary Witham and Dwight Dement were multifaceted in so much as they both played tenor sax. Uh, Dwight could play guitar, could play bass. Um, he also could play some guitar. Kerry could play uh, uh, keyboards, bass, and guitar. So anyway, we had that stack sound with us, you know, and used to do all of those horn kind of sounds. And particularly since uh, Woman, Woman, Young Girl, Lady Willpower, all of them, you know, had big horn sections. So, uh, yeah, I love the the stacks, the Muscle Shoals. Uh, in fact, we went there one time to uh, to visit and to see what we could see, and it was uh, a lot of fun to step into the to the Memphis streets, you know, to the Muscle Absorb Shoals. the vibe a little bit. Say again. Absorb the vibe a little bit. Down Absolutely. There, the spirit. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, that's where I got turned on to Zydeco and things like that. So lots of fun. Music is, is universal. And no matter if you understand it or not, if, if it pulls you in, you understand it. And, and your most uh, recent album is called Love Songs? Yes. Actually, it was recorded some time ago, but um, I realized that uh, I needed to get it out to the fans. So I put it all on disc and um, it's out there now. They can find it at my website, uh, garypocketmusic.com, along with some other things. I have our greatest hits and uh, there's one called Super Hits. Those are the original recordings. I've also got a a CD that they call Essentials 102. I don't know the reason for the title, but <laughs> it's uh, it's got a number of songs on it that are very cool from a later time. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot for people to avail themselves. Talk of. about your uh, record deal. I, I, I guess this was Jerry Fuller. Yes. Uh, got word of you guys, and you were playing in bars in San Diego. And this guy, because we're in L.A., that's, that's why this resonated with me, would drive down there to watch you guys play and ended up bringing your contracts into a bowling alley and signing them there. That's just a sort great story. Sort of like Gary found him first. Yeah, right. It's true. Yeah. Well, you just told the story, basically. Um, uh, we had been on the streets for days, it seemed like, going to all the record companies. In fact, we even tried to find Art LeBeau because he was the oldies guy in those days, you know, and uh, we found that he was a P.O. box. Um, <laughs> Tiny no guy. Matter, yeah, no matter where we went, it seemed that uh, people would say, uh, oh, yeah, OK, well, come on in, we'll take a look. And then they'd say, well, that's really not my thing. So you'll have to talk to so and so down the hall. And that kind of went on and on and on. And we were now driving out of town on Sunset Boulevard. And um, I wanted to go home hit the 405, get to the five, let's go home. I, I'm tired. I, I got to eat, got to sleep, and we got to go back to work. So uh, on the way out of town, I saw the letter CBS on the side of a building, a big gray building, kind of indistinct. And I said, keep the car running, guys. I'll be right back. If a cop comes, go around the block. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> so I went inside and there was a lady in there. You remember the old uh, Lily Tomlin bit? Yeah. One ring dingy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had the she had the pull things, you know, and she was <laughs> doing her thing, you know, and I, I stood at her window for a moment. She says, can I help you? And I said, I remember saying because I wanted to go home and I wanted her to tell me, go home, young man. I remember <laughs> saying, I remember saying, um, you wouldn't want to hear a new group, would you? <laughs> <laughs> it said, uh, just a minute. And she pulled and pushed and said, see that hallway, go down that hallway to the end, turn right, go to the second door on the right, and you'll find a guy by the name of Jerry Fuller. So I said, okay. So I went to the outside door and I waved at the guy. I said, hold on, I'll be right back. And I went down, went in his door and he's standing there pounding a nail in the wall. I said, excuse me. He turned around, looked at me, said, hey, come on in. So I walked in. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm hanging up a gold record award. I said, Wow, I have never seen a gold record up close. Can I see that? And he said, sure. So I walked up and um, he said, it's a song I actually wrote for Sam Cooke, but he didn't want it. However, Ricky Nelson did, and it sold four million copies. Oh it was God. called Traveling Man. <laughs> oh wow. So I said, oh, man, would you please look at my portfolio? And I'd put the portfolio together like a business had pictures of the group and they were pretty good pictures had um, had a demo of me actually in the prior group that I was in, but it was me singing and um, um, it had lyrics of songs that I had written and stuff. And he looked at it and he said, where can I see this group? So I told him it was called the quad room and it was in a bowling alley called the Claremont bowl. So he said, I'll, I'll be down on Saturday. Well, he showed up midnight on Friday. And he surprised me. I looked, you know, he walked up to the stage on the break and I looked at him and just for a moment didn't recognize him. Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, what are you doing here tonight? I said, I've been coasting all this week here, letting the guys sing a lot. So I'm in good voice for you. And he <laughs> said, never mind that. Let's go make a record. Wow. So he went back to Columbia Records. Well, we went out and sat in the bowling alley for a little while and talked, of course. But um, he went back to the record company, got recording and publishing contracts together, came back down to San Diego, 
And we sat in the bowling alley again in the same booth that we had been sitting in <laughs> some weeks before. And we uh, signed the contracts. And uh, I thought, you know, this is looking like it could be happening. So How now, long were you with Columbia? Were you with them for your whole career or the band's oh, whole career? Yeah, I was with them about five years. And, and unfortunately, um, at the end of my contract, I made a wrong decision. Um, uh, Jack Gold was the head of A&R then, and um, he said, uh, come on, Gary, resign. We know how to make you rich and famous. I, I wanted a little more control over my life, I, uh, my recording life, I should say. And I should have simply said, OK, Jack, you're on. Let's go. Um, but I didn't. And I took a year off, did a lot of songwriting, did a lot of introspection, et cetera, et cetera. And when I was ready to come back, the 60s had become the 70s and um, and I was no longer viable. Everybody had moved on. You know, everything had changed from the music of choice to the drug of choice, et cetera, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. so I kind of exiled myself and found myself not working really throughout the 70s. So I studied dance at the Roland Bray Dance Academy for a couple of years and uh, uh, learned how to, to dance, uh, jazz and tap and other things. Um, and it was wow. fun. It was a great process. You know, it helped me to be more, more together on stage, though I never really became a dancer as such. It wasn't my intent, uh, but it gave me a center, you know, and, and an ability to stand up there and reach out, you know, to the audience and so forth. Um, during that time, I also studied acting, which... I ended up doing a few TV shows, which were, I don't even remember what they were anymore, <laughs> but uh, um, it was a good experience, not something I really ended up wanting to do, but I was in a class uh, with Jeff Corey, who was um, the Lee Strasberg counterpart. Lee was in New York and famous and well-known. Jeff Corey was in uh, Los Angeles and also well known. Now he had been ostracized from the uh, the business during the McCarthy era, when they were uh, they were trying to catch anybody in the act of talking about communism. You know, so when they said to Jeff, uh, "Well, were you talking about such and such with so and so on such and such a night when you were here or there or whatever?" and he refused to bow to that kind of pressure. So they blackballed him from the business and he became a drama coach and worked from worked with everybody from Marilyn Monroe to Jack Nicholson to you name it and he had these great classes and I was studying with him and he called me one day and said I have a guy that wants to make a movie in the Philippine Islands and I think you're right for the part and I said why and he said because he wants an actor who's also a musician and I said well that could be me um, he said, you have to know that Sal Minio is up for the part as well. Oh, so I said, yeah. So I said, well, OK, I'll go. And um, so I went kind of bizarre, um, you know, wearing uh, kind of odd clothes and, and you know, looking sort of like I was. I, what do I want to say? Creative, you know, that kind <laughs> of thing. And uh, and uh, I walked in for the audition and he gave me the part to read and uh, called me up a little bit later and said, you're on, we're going to the Philippine Islands. And I just went, well, okay. I spent nearly six months in the Philippine Islands with a Philippine family, um, the uh, Dineros family, Cesar Dineros. And it was family funded. Um, and we had a marvelous, I mean, I can't tell you what kind of experience it was living in Urdanita village uh, in the house that was owned by the German embassy. And uh, it was it was an amazing experience, uh, experiencing the country, you know, the people, um, the culture, the and we hired a band called the Juan de la Cruz band who were the cream, as in Clapton, et cetera, of the Philippine Islands. And they became the band that I was the leader of. And the story was about a band that was elevated to success by the death of their lead member. And I was thrown into the position 
of that lead. So it was all, it, it had all kinds of potential. For whatever reason, it was never finished. They probably ran out of money. Um, but the experience, once again, was uh, was invaluable and uh, phenomenal. So I would yeah, love to tell out you Sal Minio. Come on, that's big. Wait, they yeah. never finished the movie? Where's the footage? I have no idea. It's probably, uh, you know, in the safe in the De Niro's family uh, vaults someplace. That would make a really cool documentary if we could pull that out and then have you talk about it. Let's see if we can find the right. De Niro's people <laughs> over in the Philippines. I would okay. love to do that. That would that'd be a lot of fun. We also, I took a fellow with me by the name of Craig Palmer, who uh, I knew from San Diego, and uh, he and I uh, worked with the... Um, we worked with the, uh, the the University of the Philippines Choir, and my brother David and I wrote all the music for the film. So there was some good music written. I think some of it was recorded fairly well. A lot of it was just on two track because uh, uh, we were kind of fighting the elements there. But uh, but a lot of fun, uh, and um, it, I cherish the memory. I, I would love. Let's go look for them. What do you okay, say? Okay, Gary. Yeah, <laughs> let's find it. Yeah, Pete. This will be excellent. But it's like interesting because, you know, as you said, it, it's, you, we visit a lot of different places or when you're on tour, you mm -hmm. maybe see the the airport and the and the state, the stadium or the or the concert hall. But you were living in the Philippines for six months. So <laughs> yes. that was a completely different memory for you, you know, yeah. having having experienced what it feels like to live there, to be a resident. Well, and, and that's an amazing thing. I mean, I hadn't thought about thinking about it. So in the moment, I'm, I'm just realizing the types of foods that I was eating because of the culture, you know, and the things that were so strange to me and so normal, you know, to them. But mm -hmm. uh, once again, you know, it was Southeast Asia and it, and it was a wonderful place to be for the time that I was there. When you traveled around with the Union Gap at the peak of your popularity, what country resonated with your music the most? Was it the United States? Was it? I mean, well, some guys now say Japan is their biggest audience and Germany is their biggest audience. What? What? Where, where was your biggest audience? Well, unfortunately, my management uh, kept me home instead of going overseas. Oh. Now, I have been going to Australia now for years since the big success. And I'm told by the people in Australia who received me with open arms that I was as big as the Beatles in Australia. That's hard to believe, of course, but um, I know that they love me and the music over there. So we go once every two years and spend four weeks um, and go to all the venues around the country and have a wonderful time. Um, I've been over to the UK and worked throughout um, Wales, Scotland, England, etc. Um, I've been to Germany, big crowds there, but I haven't done Germany on my own. So I've been with with um, multi act groups, mm -hmm. uh, but it's quite an experience to be with eight thousand people, say in Stuttgart, who really have a basic understanding of English, but in order to tell them the story, you need to be able to say all the words that are going to connect them to that story. And oftentimes I wasn't able to talk to them. However, when suddenly I'm going, young girl, get out of my mind, they're singing. They're just singing phonetically. And it's 8,000 people with their mouths open and singing along. So I don't know where the biggest crowds are. I know I have great crowds in Australia. We have great crowds in the U.S. And um, I'm slated to go back to the U.K. Cool. Awesome. Well, we want to thank you so much, Gary, for spending some time with us. It's really special. You'd like people to go to GaryPucketMusic.com, correct? Yeah. And that's where they can pick out what they'd like to listen to today and then something again tomorrow. They can also find me. Uh, we have a we have a Facebook fan page, mm -hmm. which is the uh, um, the Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. Um, I think that's the one right there. Yes, you found it, I believe. Yes, indeed. Thomas did. Yes, he did. <laughs> so that's well. Awesome. You know, Gary. Thank you for all these beautiful sounds that you have put into the universe, yeah. which are probably going to live forever. Oh, for sure. Really? I would certainly yeah. hope so. Thank you for that. Um, I think that we uh, 
we did something good, and I hope it'll stick around. I always think of my friend Peter Noon when I say that uh, I'm into something good. <laughs> he he too has quite a, a, quite a body. Speaking of, work. of Peter Noon, they're probably going to offer you your own gig on Sirius XM. Yeah. Would you do that? Yeah. Well, if they offer it to me, um, at right at the moment, uh, I think that I would do that. Uh, I would have to think further on it, but I really had a good time putting together the first one. That was fun. And, um, I'm, I'm thinking every morning, I get up way before my wife does, and I sit at the table and I write and think about the experiences that I've had, and I think about the songs that I love. And uh, um, if they offered it to me, uh, at this moment, I, I would say I'd do it. All well, right. well, you're great at it, so I think they should. All right, Thank here you. come our closing credits. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. And we want to thank our guest, Gary Puckett. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco DeManda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.